Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are listening. Welcome back to the We Are Everywhere podcast. Uh, my name is Clay Bird, and this is episode number 11. Um, this gentleman is coming from PDX, Portland, Oregon. Um, and I actually used to live in Portland, too, um, and we never crossed paths. So these these episodes where I don't know the person at all are my favorite because... One, I'm getting to meet new friends, and you are too. You're listening. And uh, three, we're just nerding out about fish. I, I think I said one and then skipped to three. Forget two. Who needs two? <laughs> Our guest today is Joseph Rosenberg. What's up, man? How are you? Good morning, Clay. Nice to meet you. Good. Nice to meet you too, man. Yeah. Thanks for sitting by and listening to me butcher your intro there. <laughs> oh, you know, on a scale of two to three, I give it a three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to ask you because I talked about this on our, um, I see you're sipping on your, uh, uh you're drinking coffee right now. Yeah. It's still very much morning here. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm drinking coffee, uh, right along with you, but I was going to ask if you're a Bev guy. Sure. I mean, I've got a coconut water right here with me as well. Dude, that's what I'm saying. I got, I got the coffee. I got the seltzer. I got the basic water. Like I've mm -hmm. turned into this Bev guy over time to <laughs> Just I have like three or four drinks in front of me at all times, and I drink them all at the same time. Had this been a little bit later in the afternoon, I imagine there would probably be a you know a dank beer here too. You know, mm -hmm. like Portland is kind of the beer unofficial, maybe beer capital of the country, maybe official. I guess it depends on who you talk to, but yeah, uh, no, I feel like it's pretty official. There's like in Portland, one thing that I noticed is no matter where you're at in the city. Um, you can throw a rock and either hit a brewery or a dispensary. <laughs> it's like Truth. they're everywhere. Um, so knowing that you're from Portland, um, tell us, uh, you know, a little bit about you, who you are, where you're from originally, what you do, the whole scoop. Heck yeah. Um, so I am New England born and raised. Uh, grew up northern Massachusetts, southern New Hampshire, Maine, family from all three of those areas. And, uh, and then went through my you know, primary schooling there. And, uh, and so fish was obviously a big deal uh, in New England when I was, you know, basically from 91 on, I was in junior high. And, and, um, and so my parents were really young when they had me 22 and 20. So by the time I was 10, and it's 19, you know, 89 and 12, 91, my dad is only 33. So, gotcha. I mean, as a 42 year old, who's still going to a lot of shows right now. I can only imagine how he was feeling at 33, you know, with the constraints of <laughs> home ownership career, a couple of small kids, but still very much into the Grateful Dead scene. Uh, so that's oh, okay, kind gotcha. of where my roots of this kind of jam music came up. Um, my dad saw his first show in 72 and just loved to talk about the whole thing with the Dead family. And um, and so I went through school, you know, in New England and then um, and then kind of took a weird path, didn't go to college right after high school, ended up doing fish instead. Um, this would have been 97 to 2000. So oh, perfect, you know, kind of jumped on the fish bandwagon. And my parents were like, are you going to go to school? And it's like, well, I'm really having a lot more fun traveling the country and seeing yeah. fish. So Learning be, a lot more too. <laughs> yeah. Street smarts for sure. There'll be yeah. time to see, there'll be time to go to school. And, yeah. um, and so my partner at the time, towards like the end of 1.0, um, she ended up getting into a program at Northern Arizona University. And I had been through Flagstaff on the fall 2000 tour when, you know, Fish played Phoenix and then Chula Vista. And we had a couple of days off there. So one of my friends with us had gone to NAU and introduced me to the town. And I loved it. And I got back from tour. And she was like, hey, we've got it narrowed down to a few spots. Asheville, Boone, North Carolina is one, and Flagstaff. And I was like, oh, I was just in Flagstaff. That town's killer. So we moved there. So we moved to Flagstaff in early 2001 and um, lived out in northern Arizona, which is beautiful, amazing country there. Southern Utah, northern Arizona is just epically gorgeous. Oh, yeah. yeah. It is. Yeah. Just killer. And living close to Vegas, you know, we were able to like hit a couple of those Vegas runs. We can get into all that. And um, and then from Flagstaff ended up in Humboldt, California, um, on okay. the northern coast, way up. Um, I've heard some stories about Humboldt. There, <laughs> some oh. documentaries man <laughs> interesting i know if i know more than a few people in that one documentary oh um, really yeah the murder mountain yeah sure. oh yeah. yeah that's what it's called yeah familiar faces 
for sure. And one of my oh, good shit. friends actually declined being, you know, in the movie. And I didn't even realize this until just recently. It's funny you bring that up. Um, it's like how many years later, that, you know, 15 years later. Um, so anyway, I had a great time at Humble. It was very, very small town, very farm oriented, uh, indoor, outdoor farms, both, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's Humble. And, um, yeah. And then ended up meeting someone who lived in Portland. This was in 2007 and started coming up here a lot, a lot, and then moved here and have been here since. So kind of a east to west trajectory where never yeah. look back, not not going back to live on the east coast ever again. Um, yeah. I'm a west coast kid now. I've actually hit the eclipse of where I've been on the west coast longer than I've been on the east coast in my life. So, oh, wow. Yeah, is that a weird, weird feeling? It is. It is. And um, <laughs> yeah. I've got some siblings on the East Coast and and they've all got kids now. So it's great for my mom. She doesn't have to constantly be asking me, when am I coming home? <laughs> my family knows, like, I'm yeah. home, you know. Yeah. Um, so here I am in 22 living in uh, North Portland. And I, this town is, like a lot of towns, has kind of been rough and tumble over the past couple of years with the pandemic. But we're doing yeah. the best we can. And I, I still love it here. I can't imagine living anywhere else. So you said you're in North Portland. Are you in Northeast or Northwest? North, technically. So oh, Port okay. Portland's like the five quadrants, right? And okay, um, gotcha. I'm up uh, near St. John's, so pretty out, far out on the peninsula. Um, cool. But yeah, actually, far uh, enough away from all the the craziness. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's crazy. Sure, craziness of like the hustle of like inner Southeast. I lived in like Buckland yeah. and Laurelhurst for four years and got a taste of what it was like to live in just that happening neighborhood. And it was, yeah. it was great. Everything's walkable and Portland's oh, yeah. really beautiful. There's a, a lot, Portland was in the news a lot a couple of years ago with the protests and everything like that. And I feel like most people that hate Portland have never been here and they just heard what they heard on the news. It's not like that at all, you know? Yeah. And even, even whenever I was there, you know, there's, you know, cause there's always, I don't want to say always, but it seems like it's, a very popular occurrence for, you know, protests to happen there. You know, mm -hmm. there were, from the time, the four years, four years that I lived there, it seemed like there was one at least every month, if not every other weekend. And, you know, whenever they get this news coverage, you know, it, they, it looks bad on mm -hmm. like a TV. dumpster fire. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. And so like my parents would call me and be like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, it's like, it's, it is going on. But what, you, what no one understands is it's literally like, a four block radius exactly. downtown yes, of like where you. this is happening. And, right. and the rest of the city is like just fine. It's just one little Business area. This is usual, like three blocks outside of Pioneer Square downtown. You know, it's not a big deal. <laughs> yeah. You go to the east side, you'd never have any idea this stuff was even yeah. happening. You're like, what's happening? <laughs> yeah. So that's one thing that like it does get a bad rap on the news and stuff, but it's really just little little bitty piece <laughs> if, if this <laughs> you know? would come back and play here that would be sweet it's uh been since 99 at the racetrack and wow. been since fall 96 since they played indoors in this town which is just uh egregious in my opinion come on boys let's go let's bring it back yeah like why couldn't they do the moda center they could yeah you know easily they do, they do eugene instead and eugene is maybe the headiest city in the country you know, like it's one of those vibes. It's yeah. very heezy, dead family-esque down there for sure. So I get why they want to go tap into that. And the shows always seem to be a little more psychedelic in Eugene, um, a little <laughs> more open-ended. Um, yeah. But I know a lot of people here that even the Memorial Coliseum, let's go. Let's get back indoors yeah. in Portland. There's a lot of people here that would love to not to be able to sleep in your own bed after the show. I haven't experienced <laughs> that in a very long time. <laughs> that would yeah. be amazing, dude. Can you imagine being like, like in 93, I think it was, or it might have even been after that, but like they were at like the Roseland. Can you imagine seeing fish at the Roseland Theater? Or Mount Tabor Theater in like 90. I've never been there. 92 or 93. Yeah, I think don't think it exists anymore, but it's this tiny theater up on like 53rd and Hawthorne on the east side and gotcha. um, right at the base of the mountain. And I mean, fish played there and played awesome set lists. I don't think, I think it was 92, maybe 91 uh, or whenever they first came out. So it could have been even early 93. Uh, yeah. But my goodness, Roseland, the town, Tabor Theater would have been just incredible venues God. to see fish, like just Dude. drooling over yourself. Thinking about <laughs> yeah. It. Yeah. Even like you're at the very back, like Trey, like they're just right there. It's like, there's not a bad seat in the house. And at that point in their careers where they were so freaking hungry, just, just, just a vicious, insatiable animal every night. Yeah. 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 That's kind of what we were talking about um, on the last episode. Like we kind of dove into some 93 a little bit. Um, 
But now that we know about you and your trek across east to west, um, where in that journey did you discover and get hooked on fish? So um, my first fish experience was weird. Um, like I said, I spent some time in southern Maine. My family has some property there. And it's a little tiny beach town called Old Orchard Beach. And uh, like 7,000 people live there in the off season. It's, it's a little nothingness. And there's a minor league baseball park. And in 1994, I was, you know, 14 that summer. Um, bands used to play there. Uh, once the baseball team left and the ballpark still existed, bands would come through. It's a little beach town on your way up to Canada or wherever. And, uh, and Fish played there on July 3rd of 94. And okay. my dad, who was big into the dead, and he was still seeing the dead all the way up through, you know, Jerry's passing. Um, you know, they had obviously been hearing about fish. My dad is, you know, I'm 14. My dad's 36. He's young. He's hearing about fish coming up for the last decade. And, um, and they were playing the ballpark like a mile from where we lived. And after dinner, he's like, let's just take a walk over to the ballpark and we, we'll be able to hear the music great outside. You know, there'll be a little bit of a parking lot scene. You know, he wanted to introduce <laughs> me to that. And so we went over and it ended up being like a pretty sweet show in retrospect. Should have probably spent the 18 bucks and gone inside. You know, <laughs> yeah. it wasn't sold out. Clearly, it's like, a you know, uh, a, a venue that holds like six or eight thousand people in 94 in, in Maine. Maybe it was sold out. Who knows? Um Paying so anyway, 18 bucks to see fish like <laughs> or even less, maybe probably yeah. 14 or 15 bucks that yeah. summer. We're like, nah, pass. We'll just listen from out here. It's free. <laughs> um, yeah. And so that was like the first time I heard fish live and not seeing it and being inside um, and seeing the vibe of the crowd and the energy and the, and the whole situation. Uh, I it was just music to me. I was seeing grunge music and wanting to go to shows that I could crowd surf and mosh pit at the time, you know. Sure. And um, and so anyway, my dad loved it. And it was just like fish this and fish that. And so then I'm in high school, which is like that that year and the next year. I was like a freshman going into my sophomore year that summer. And I remember being in PE class and um, some of the kids getting next to me. Some, some of these kids actually brought me to my first show eventually down the line. Uh, this one kid, Robbie, in particular. Um, we're talking about, it's December 95, and they're talking about going fishing. And I wasn't getting it at all, like their conversation. And they were going to like skip out on a couple of days of class. And like they were talking about going to the UMass Amherst shows like in early December 95. And I, I had no idea what they were talking about. It didn't make sense to me. And um and so fish started to becoming this thing more and more because once they came back from the shows they were you know doing stretches in pe and they were you know talking about they were seniors getting blitzed at umass I like i don't get it like <laughs> yeah. they're like we're going fishing dude fishing i was like oh okay i get it ph fishing it's like the first time i realized like ph fit you know you get you had those uh aha moments at life um yeah and so that next summer i remember uh sitting down with some friends and cracking junta for the first time and we started there and um i mean just the first three tracks on junta are just ridiculous like fee esther you enjoy myself i think is how it opens you know or something yeah, like that and something um, like that so those songs are all in the, the first mix and all three of those songs are totally completely different and then you get to contact on the backside, the second disc and and that was where it was like what am i hearing you know, and then, you know, my homie came over and he was like a week later, he's like, I got the Rift album. And so we went through Rift. And at that point, I just loved music. I was trying to absorb and take in as much music as I could. And so it started with Rift and Junta. Um, and I remember we tried to get through Union Federal and that's difficult. You know, that's <laughs> difficult to to understand and appreciate when, you know, you're listening to Alice in Chains and Soundgarden and Pearl Jam on one end of it. You know, and then yeah. you have this, this, I don't know what, like trumpets going on. And it's like, sometimes it's in key and other times it's changing time signatures. And I was way unprepared for that. Even having listened to like the dead's hundred year hall and some of the live things that Dick's picks that they had been doing. Um, right. Even the, like, it was more like space than it was anything else. And we would skip over space, you know, that we weren't into space when we were 14, 15 years old. Yeah. Um, and so it was years until I saw my first show after that. Um, and so that's kind of how Fish came into my life, those first two CDs. And then I met someone somewhere along the way, have a hard time I was trying to think about the, who this person was in my life that introduced me to like tape trees and B and P's blanks and postage, you know, and started yeah. getting into tape trading. And, um, and I remember getting 
the 71394 Patterson show with the okay. uh, Cavern Wilson Cavern mashup and then just like Monster Tweezer Fest. And okay. that was where things totally blew open for me, where I was like, holy fuck, this is that was that. This is ripping. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I still didn't know what it was like to be there and experience it and see it with everybody. And so it was still probably another year after that. This is all 96. I probably started getting as deep into like trading trapes as I could and uh, just collecting the tape collections, having many tape cases, you know, it was so much fun to be a part of that. And you'd make friends through the mail and it was all through the mail, you know, and tapes would come like when they come and it would always be like Christmas morning. And, um, and I remember one specific tape trade where uh, I can't remember the show that came back, but it might have been Worcester 97 tapes that were coming in because okay. one of the one of the tapes that came along with it was uh, one of the first tapes from the Bearsville outtakes. And I remember hearing bits of like the meat stick and um, and just that whole Bearsville session that went on in, in 98 and having none the tape wasn't labeled. So I had no idea what it was for a while because the Internet's oh, like I... barely a thing, you know, and. Gadiel's page didn't have like a, I don't think it had like a comment section or a message board at all attached to it. So you couldn't really communicate with other people through it. And I didn't know about rec.music.fish at that time. So, um, which I think was probably still around in, in 96, 97 until um, some of the other sites came online. So um, yeah, through tape trading and piquing my interest. And eventually uh, I was like, I just heard from enough people like you have to go. You have to go do this. Listening is just not getting it done. You can listen all day long, but if you don't go, you're doing yourself a disservice. So yeah. I went. Yeah. And so leading into that, well, for, hold on. I heard something in your in your tape trading story. Like, what kind of person sends a tape and doesn't label it? Like, <laughs> especially if it's like a really good show, you're like, where is this from? I need to know. I know. The only thing I can think of is that maybe that person had it unlabeled. You know, oh, yeah, they got it unlabeled. Right. Because like mystery show. What's really funny is that on this particular Balesville tape and there was like a 20 second clip of like the intro to Jennifer dances. Um, so this is 98. So they had been working on this all the way back since then. Jennifer dances has been in like the, in the fish cannon all the way since like Bearsville. And I don't think it's on the version of Bearsville you can find on like the Internet. So I, I thought it was a fever dream at one point until I'm in Rochester in the fall of 99 and they play it in the second set. And I look to the person next to me and, and right before they play it, Trey announces like, we're going to play a new song. And, and as they're going into it, I looked at the person next to me and I was like, I've heard this before. I've, I'm always jumping up and down. I was like, I've heard this before. And he's like, dude, they just said they're playing this for the first time. And I was like, like well, no. whatever. Yeah. No, like somewhere. And then eventually finding the Bears real tape again year later. Cause I mean, tapes were part of my car and touring system all the way through the end of 1.0. We didn't have, you maybe had the disc man and the, the, the car velcro to the dashboard or whatever but it was <laughs> yeah. it was all tapes um and so yes that jennifer dances was part of the bearsville tape so maybe he so, just didn't know any of the tracks or it wasn't labeled for him i don't know but either way thanks dude whoever you are because that tape was fucking killer how did you how did you find out what it was eventually like because you know you just said it was the bearsville what how did you find out like internet so probably um sometime after 2000 when um i guess the internet became a little bit more I, beyond accessible, but also just like more substance to a lot of the fish stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I probably just put it together. Like, and then I was, saw some of the track listings cause there's like a clip of sod again on there and there's a little bit of me and there's, it's like a lot of the ghost stuff, you know, mm -hmm. um, there's an instrumental version of NICU on it and things like that. And, um, and eventually I started, you know, being like, Oh, this is this tape and went through and the songs are sometimes in a little bit different order. So, uh, had to do the research myself. No one ever filled in the <laughs> blanks on that tape. But like I said, that you was, did it. That was really cool. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome, man. Um, okay, so assuming that we're not counting the the show in '94 that you saw yeah, at the baseball that. field, that's not part of your stats. When and where was your first official show? My first official show, in my opinion, might be the hidden gem of the entire fall 97 tour, which was uh, 12, 12, 97, the first night of Albany, uh, 12, the last 12. two nights of, of tour. And, um, and, oh man, I could just talk about this for the next two hours. And, uh, See, and I, I know exactly what show you're talking about. It opens up with funky bitch, 2001 camel walk. So, yep. 
um, okay, right off the bat, it's like hanging out outside of Albany. It's got that area directly in front of the venue where everybody kicks it, you know, the entire pre-show. And so just having gone to other concerts and never really seen anything like that before, um, the smells, the sounds, the the colors, the experiences, the clothing, just the the vibe the of the whole people. thing. The, oh my goodness! Like it, it felt like I had stepped through a portal and was back home after like you know several lifetimes of being away. And You're like, um, this is it. Yes, I found my tribe, and I hadn't even gone inside the show yet. But I knew that I was going <laughs> to love fish, having listened to them for years. And, right, right. Um, you know, uh, so the whole vibe of going inside and then getting in there and, you know, we got in 20, 30 minutes before the lights came down. And, and then when that happens and the whole crowd just goes into their eruption and then the band comes out and just starts to rip into this funky bitch. And it was like, yeah, like I'd heard the song on tapes, but I wasn't familiar with Sun Seals or anything, you know, so I only knew this yeah. version. And, um, and then instantly, as soon as the first note hits, the entire audience is just like this ocean of swaying and moving. And it was like, holy shit, like every single person that I can see right now is getting down. And I had been going to parties like raves and stuff at that point okay. too in my life. So like we were, we had moves, like we could dance, you know, we had seen electronic <laughs> music and things like that, but this was like just a totally different vibe. Like the whole crowd was moving as like one giant amoeba. It felt like, and I was probably on some extracurriculars too, a little sparkle sure. in my vision. And yeah. um, that definitely helped. Uh, but just being blown away by the second the music started, everybody like knew what to do, like to your positions and it's go time. Um, and then of course, like uh, when the 2001 came in second song, um, I appreciate it a lot more now than I did then. Um, not that okay. I didn't appreciate it then um, because it was long, groovy, totally instrumental, just get after it time. Um, and then the camel walk. And, and again, looking back, it's like, damn, what a run to open up your first show in the fall of 97. Like who am I to, to uh, have lucked into such a situation, you know? Dude. And that's such like, <clears throat> you ask basically anyone that knows something about fish, you know, enough about fish to say, to talk about fall 97, like what an epic time to jump in and like, get on the train during mm -hmm. like arguably the best era and year and tour of fish like that's you hit the fucking jackpot man <laughs> you can see in the bittersweet movie how just elated the band was to be on stage at the time you know like when they're showing clips from the rochester show and trey just his pose his demeanor like we joke like i uh i've got some friends and we, we stream shows on Tuesday nights, like when fish started doing their dinner in a movie on mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, they used to do it once a week and then they moved it to once a month. Mm -hmm. And so we just kept doing it on Tuesdays and we've done it on Tuesday every week since for the most part, we're about to go into year three, like in a month. It's crazy. So there's like a core group of us that do this every Tuesday night. There's a, like 150 shows on YouTube you can stream. And so, yeah, I was about to say, do you just ran randomly pick yeah, one? Yeah. One of my friends, like we'll take a little poll what we want to watch. And, um, so going through and watching a lot of the old videos and especially the 97 videos, like Trey would get like when he's really jamming, his right elbow flares out, out. Yeah. And it's like elbow out is like a thing. We want to get that on a t-shirt, elbow <laughs> out. Elbow. Uh, and there's a lot of that in the fall of 97, just a lot of Trey just really, there's times where he's like grooving, he's like dancing in between songs, like the 12-6 um, the show, like, you know, they open up with antelopes like the second song and like it's really funky antelope and like trey's just like straight up getting down during it you know it's like oh man like these guys are having so much fun um this is a great time to be alive and on fish tour um i wish i had gone sooner i was supposed to go see some of the worcester shows and got pretty sick like a couple weeks prior and had to miss the entire oh, weekend no. i know Damn. and then thankfully these albany tickets manifested so i went to both nights and um and you know the, the rest of the first set was great tweezer things like that i mean tweezer at your first show fuck yeah and then yeah the second set is where i think things got really special uh and why i think the show is so underrated um because the saw it again piper caspian segment of that show all three of those songs might be like best ever versions um the piper is just fire hose rage fest like my goodness and this is a video that we watch this is like 12 12 is one of the ones that you can stream and on um, youtube 
Yeah, and so we watched that one a few times for sure. There's a handful of shows that we've gone to probably five or six times. Like <laughs> four four ninety eight is another one we've watched a lot, and um, you know twelve thirty ninety six is another one we actually nicknamed the Weeper, and uh, and we actually the named Weeper our little Slack channel after the Weeper. Yeah, it's like just a kind of funny story where we're in, we do have a Slack thing going on while we're streaming, so we can communicate to each other. You know. Um, okay, got you. So you're not all in the same place. No, doing, we're all over okay. the country. Yeah. Gotcha. Sorry. Okay, cool. Yeah. So that's why we're all like, because it started with pandemic, you know, when nobody could mm -hmm. see each other and we just kept it going. It's like a little Tuesday dudes club we have. And, yeah. um, and so we'll slack and, you know, one of my friends just made a spelling error or autocorrect and he tried to write tweezer and it corrected to weeper. And it was during the middle of this just blitzing tweezer. And so it became the weeper. And so that group is now known as the weeper and that show is known as the weeper. And, um, <laughs> Thanks, thanks to whoever the dudes are who recorded those shows, um, like the, especially the dude who recorded the island tour. We refer to him as our hero, and he's got a welcome <laughs> seat at our Thanksgiving table whenever he wants, whoever you are. Um, you are incredible, and the work you did is amazing. And thank you so much for going through the trouble of sneaking in that camcorder. <laughs> uh, dude, that's awesome because like, you'll find those. Uh, my favorite ones on YouTube are the ones with like the OG – like old school camcorder footage Heck yeah but the like the soundboard and like this the audio quality has been dubbed over it and like synced up so the the quality is the audio quality is great and then like you're getting to see like the actual like you know they're moving around trying to keep it steady you know oh everything. yeah it's like exactly how you would think if you had like a head full and you were like trying to like be mindful <laughs> of your neighbors and we joke about that too like this guy is the recording is doing exactly where my head was at that time, which was like yeah. spinning in circles and about to explode off the top of my head. <laughs> um, and and just like the the dedication that that has. Yeah, they are heroes, man. Because imagine yeah. like having a whole going to a fish show and being like this the whole time. Mm -hmm. Or just bringing man. the tripod in in your pants, you know, and <laughs> yeah. I mean, how else were you Walking getting with the in? limp? I yeah. imagine maybe they were maybe some tapers were bringing in some gear for some of these people. Uh, man, the tapers even maybe anymore. Yeah. There, there, I don't, you know, there used to be a taper section. You could request tickets from fish tickets by mail back when you had to mail in your money orders, decorate your envelopes and everything like that with colored stars. And um, I guess I didn't even think about if there are still people that tape shows, but there must be, right? Yeah, yeah. I've seen <clears throat> um, the main spot that I've seen tapers that comes to mind is at Dick's. Mm -hmm. um, they're right next to the soundboard. And it's, it's pretty small uh, there's a handful of them yeah probably five see. or six now instead of like the 20 or 30 there used to be you know yeah yeah because at this i mean in this day and age it's like i don't want to say we don't need tapers because they're such a they have been such a big part of the community and you know even going way back that's like really the only source that you're getting your fish from so i don't want to say that they're not really needed now because it feels disrespectful but in the day and age that we're in like the second that the show's done you can just download the soundboard on the internet you know it's, literally it's, like before you yeah. go to sleep that night if you're partying after the show it's up you know yeah um yeah i also i'll just touch on this i do love the audience recordings a lot especially on the shows that i was at because you get those random crowd swells and bursts and that brings you right back to the hair chill standing up on your arms and uh you know, that won't ever be replaced by the soundboard recordings, which doesn't really capture the crowd's contribution to what's going on. It's very clean and amazing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, also a, probably a lot of why people were so harshly critical of fish and, you know, especially in the early 3.0 era was because we were getting access to 2.0, I guess, too, because they were out then. But um, you're getting access to these cleanest recordings where you're, you know, you're hearing the flubs a little bit more because you're not hearing the audience interaction, but it's never about hitting all the notes, you know, right. it's about like, how the fuck do you feel right now? Do you feel yeah. great? Then that, that go with that, you know, what's the energy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Trey even says that on, uh, you mentioned bittersweet motel earlier. He even says that there's like a scene where he's in his hotel after the show and he's like sitting on the bed and he's like, who said we had a bad show? Who said, was it Brad? He oh, yeah. Because get the fuck it. out of here, you fucking tool. And that's like, oh, that's a, the classic all time. Oh, yeah. Line. No, that's another good part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he flips him off. Throws the that can was my the profile picture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was my profile picture for a long time. We um, missed a change. We said we missed a change. Exactly. What a yeah. great, what a great interaction there. <laughs> Thanks, Trey. He's, yeah. he's so real. You know, it's like he's just I know. saying what we all think. <laughs> yeah. I love him. Um, so knowing that you, you're 
it's hard to you know sway from this uh knowing that your first time seeing fish was in 97 um but do you have a favorite year of fish that isn't that oh you know i was thinking about this a little bit i, I listened to a few of your episodes so i'd have kind of an understanding of the format of how things go but i also didn't want to necessarily tread on anybody else's stories or i thought it would just be kind of fresh if i came into it with and i'm going to go back and i'll listen to all the rest because i love hearing people talk about fish you know yeah, but i also too. didn't want to necessarily follow the exact patterns of some of the other guests so i um, yeah so i think like my favorite my favorite year of fish has got to be 95 um and 53 show fall tour get out of here with that like fish plays like <laughs> fish might play 50 shows a year now they're doing 53 shows on the fall tour that year right and um and this december 95 especially um and then it's so tough like i would like i almost want to rank them but they're all like within fractions of a point of each other where you know <laughs> yeah. like they're all like right at like 12 to 14 percent across the board of how much i love them all because 94 next and then 97 93 98 96 i would say in that wow. order but like what they do in 90 and i know i went really fast there we can see <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, for, for someone that said you didn't want to pre-plan that that sounded like a pretty pre-planned statement <laughs> I, we just you said those super quick we we talk about this a lot like because we see we basically see a fish show every tuesday night and we yeah. talk we're talking a lot about fish and a lot of our memories and so a lot of the stuff that i hadn't thought about in years um is kind of on the forefront over the past couple of years like i'm more into fish now than i was at any point since 2004 all the way to like 2020 or 2019 mm -hmm. so that's pretty pretty crazy like pandemic has allowed me to like drop back into my roots of fish and what i wanted to do and and i saw a lot of shows in 3.0 it wasn't that it was just like it was more of just going to like see the people and do the thing i wasn't getting as high, not like high drugs, but just like high <laughs> mentally uh, from the experience as much. And it was more like a reunion than it was like being blown away by the band so much. Um, and then, you know, we did a lot of these shows and was able to tap back into a lot of the old groove. And so we talk about this a lot anyway, long story short, like what are our favorite years? Where do we think Fish was? Like, what is it about these tours? Because we're, we're hanging out for three, three and a half hours every Tuesday and we talk about Fish almost the whole time. Right. You know? Yeah. So when I rip off a list like this, it might seem like, I, you know, put something together. But really, this is just what we've been talking about a lot for yeah, two years. Yeah, it's, it's uh, fresh, fresh on it the is. brain. It is. It's very fresh. And it, it, they're obviously, those are all 1.0 years. Um, yeah. I did the vast majority of my fish seeing in 1.0. Um, out of I, I've seen 167 shows or something. And, oh, nice. and like 100 of those or more were in 1.0, you know. Wow. So, um was lucky to jump on at the tail end so once i saw my first show it was full throttle all through 98 <laughs> 99 and 2000. yeah, yeah this is like, what this is what i do now <laughs> yeah literally that's why you know my parents like you're gonna go to school it was like well you know i'm gonna see 20 30 40 fish shows a year until uh, ultimately yeah. until it stopped and i'm glad i did because um yeah. you know they stopped playing and we didn't have them for a while um yeah and, and you so, didn't know if they were coming back, you know, that's where you say to your parents, can right. I live while I'm young? And then we moved, you know, and it was like, well, fish took hiatus. We should get our lives together. Let's move to Arizona. We'll go to school. We'll do the, we'll do the thing, you know? Yeah. Um, and so 95 is, 94 is so similar. The jams are a little bit more angular, especially like in the, the fall tour, but like what they were doing in like, especially the heart of summer of 94, like, uh, that UIC show specifically 618, like that might be the one of the best ever versions of Bowie, it might be one of the best ever versions of Reba. There's a you enjoy myself, that's a or a, a tweezer, I think, all in that second set. Um, Solid. Like my goodness. Uh 61894. Holy, holy shnikes. That's a that's an all-timer. That's gonna be like one of the top 10 fish shows of all time, I think, in my opinion. Um yeah, it's it's for sure up there. Yeah. And what they were doing there you can kind of see how it transitioned into 95. 95 was a little bit more chaotic. They were really going tight to opening things up all over the place. First set stuff, second set stuff, opening shows with tweezer reprise, ending the first set with another tweezer reprise, just all kinds of crazy set with shenanigans, you know, which they'd been doing forever. And, um, and then, so those two years were so formative for me too, because I had a lot of those 94 tapes, a lot of the 95 tapes, the Worcester 
95 holiday run with the gin and the real me. I don't think that left my, oh. my car for like a month or two, like Dude. maybe the, the, one of the most elite fish transitions of all time, you know, oh, it's uh, so hundred percent. And that's one it's weird enough. Like, um, I'm always, I'm, I'm not always, I'm in this group text. Like I'm sure a lot of fish people mm -hmm. are. And I always forget that there's these core jams that I always forget. And the, the one that you just talked about, the real me, like the segue, like that's one I always forget about. And it's so good. I'm always having to ask them like, what was the, you know, and I can't piece together sometimes even the songs, like there's this really good contact and I can never remember the date. And so like once every like month and a half, I'm like in the group, I'm like, what was that like really good contact? Or like, what was that gin real me? Like, <laughs> cause I can never remember, man. I guess I could just look in my, uh, my fish uh, companion there that I have, but it's easier to just text and be like, make someone else do the work, you know? <laughs> yeah. And you never know like where the conversation might tangent. And then you're in like a totally different conversation of reliving tour memories. And you're like, wow, this was a really great 20 minutes of texting we just did. Cause now I feel yeah. like so much happier about my day, you know? Yeah. yeah. We we're I having fun and we're going to still have fun for sure. Yeah. Um, Dude. So are yeah. you, so being on the West coast, um, I never seeing, you know, the, tour dates get released um not a lot of west coast love um are you planning on seeing any shows this this run or no you know um initially i thought no and then i of course like reconsidered and and, and a and a friend that it's funny like uh i've been you had a guess of you had a guest on your show brian weinstein and that's how i found oh, yeah. your podcast um yeah, and brian Brian's and great. i have been part of a yeah agreed totally and um, Brian and I have been part of this really like super low key niche fish message board for the past 20 years um, that can kind of spring up off of Andy Gadiel's page and um, and emails tabs. You know, anybody that's like old school back in the day that used to go to Gadiel's page and then the emails tabs and play with that boomerang and everything like this web board sprung from that. And we're in our third or fourth iteration of it. But the core hundred of us are all like still part of this message board and, and Brian is. And so, um, do you want to say the name of it or do you want to keep it low key? You know, I thought about that. I'll <laughs> say the name of it. You know, we don't hype it up enough. It's called oceans of Osiris. Oceans of Osiris. Okay. Yeah. And it was called the rhombus initially. And Got so it. there was a link off of Andy Gadiel's page to the rhombus that, you know, started in like August of 2000 and I joined in 2002 and, um, and, email and jeff goldberg like they owned it and then our friend damon bought kind of took it over from them and re rebranded it as ocean of osiris in the, like early 2007 and then we've had a few versions of osiris because of you know hosting issues and things like that um and now we're on o3 right now so the third version i want to say of oceans of osiris and um and my friend cappy now runs it he's one of uh us that does the slack streaming on tuesday nights too cool. and um and brian's a part of this board and has been for at least as long as i have probably longer so 20 22 years and um and so when he first started kicking around the idea of wanting to do his podcast attendance bias um obviously there was a lot of support from us and um and then he kicked out his podcast and i know you were on that and um mm -hmm. he was on yours you guys kind of traded off and yeah um you know i love the vibe of both like i can just listen to people talk about fish like especially while i'm on a bike ride or a dog walk or whatever, I'm doing something solo, just throw on people shooting the shit, like reliving memories. Cause a lot of the, the conversations are going to be stuff that I was probably at too, you know, yeah. at least emit feelings of, of similarity. Um, and, and so, um, shoot, where was I going with that? <laughs> kind of lost my train of thought. Um, we were just talking about the, uh, the message boards and, you know, listening to different, people's takes you know it, and it's fun like that's the whole reason that i started this podcast i was like man i because i do another podcast that i've been doing for a couple of years and we there's no real agenda or it's not about fish or music or anything we just literally start the mic and talk shit for an hour and catch up it's me and another friend and then as you know as the pandemic <clears throat> went on i was like getting excited you know whenever 2020 2021 tour was actually going to happen so i'm like all excited you know and i pull out my surrender to the flows and like you know trying to get like hyped up for tour and i was like dude why is this not like why am i not doing a fish podcast like i'm doing podcasts anyway like i can meet 
people from all over the country talk about fish for an hour, you know, every week. And it's just like, mm -hmm. why not? It's like the best thing ever. It's so fun. I, remember, I remember the question you asked me now. Sorry, I was trying to think of that because I kind of got tangentially. Oh, if you're going to shows. Yeah, if I was going to shows, I <laughs> when I start when the floodgates are opened, and I'm a New Englander, I've got Sicilian parents. Like I'm a talker, so sorry everybody, but you're gonna <laughs> no, dude, that's what this is for. Yeah, um, and so anyway, I decided um, a friend of mine on the message board who I'd never met, um, who I really respect his opinion. He is one of the nerdiest fish people I know outside of like Zizix. You know, like he's on par with like the timer. Like he'll listen to entire tours. He'll come up with a Slay fan select section of things he wants us to hear. He's about as nerdy of a fan as I know, and I fucking love that. And Those are my favorite people. Me man. too. And I've never met him. He's a professor at Dartmouth. And, um, oh, wow. And he, he wants to maybe do the Toronto Alpine run. And so I wasn't okay. thinking about doing fish at all. And I've seen fish in both Toronto and Alpine already in my life. And, you know, I was like, oh, Dave's going to do this like i would consider doing toronto and alpine so i put in requests for toronto and alpine what the fuck you know yeah. <laughs> so i wasn't planning on maybe doing any of it uh and now and then i realized alpine's the very end of that leg prior to dick so like mm -hmm. there'll be something spectacular going on at alpine over three nights that'll be a great experience to go do so hopefully i get the tickets and i'll get to go i haven't been to alpine yeah. since the fall uh summer of 2000 so it's been a long time dude yeah i've been to alpine a couple of times and it's it's funny because it's such like an epic you know it, like with the dead even in obviously fish like there's all these epic shows that have happened there you know and i was super excited my first time going to alpine and then whenever you get there you're like dude this is literally just in the middle of fucking nowhere highway d <laughs> highway d you know that's all i remember dude. like you take this road that's called d and it's like okay like, fuck. yeah <laughs> <laughs> taking the d yeah dude but yeah and there's no like you can't do shit there like it's no they they're locked they have that shit locked down dude <laughs> and obviously you know you've been and anybody that's been is has heard about what the the venue itself is like but it's fucking bonkers like it's it's unlike any it's like so beyond what the gorge is in sheer of like hill and steepness i i mean i don't want to give the false impression i think the gorge is a superior venue but right um just the way Alpine opens up and that rolling hills. And there's like a, a, at least one giant tree in the middle of the lawn. I want to say from my memory, it's been a long time. <laughs> maybe I don't remember that. Maybe I think there is, like, at least there was a, maybe, maybe it could be all be a fever dream play. I'm not really <laughs> quite sure. Um, but I do remember there maybe being a tree or two. And um, the two times I went, I had pavilion tickets. So I was fortunate to like be able to get down low. And my first time there was um, summer 99 and they opened up with like, you know, something into like a really long 35 minute fluff head. Oh, and nice. like, I think the longest fluff head ever, you know, and, uh, and the t people were throwing the tortillas around like tortilla wars are a thing in the <laughs> pavilion at Alpine. And I, I had no idea about that. And just remember like getting hit with like tortillas and this long, super long fluff head jam. And, um, so Alpine was really special, um, kind of a sloppy show, but a really great encore that night with the camel walk and alumni blues for the first time in forever. I was That's a big cool. bust out of that show. So my memories of Alpine are pretty good. Um, and, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, I am imagining Fish will do a, a fall West Coast tour again. You know, you think seems so? like I do. Um, I mean, they are doing a lot of dates in the summer. Like, yeah, I, that's what I was going to say. I can't remember it, the last time they did a tour this big. It's got to be decades. Yeah, that's what I was seeing. That's or that's what I've been seeing online. Is you know people are like, well, maybe we'll get the fall West Coast, and people are like, I don't know, because they're playing hella shows in the summer, so it might just that be it. But I guess we'll just have to wait and see, man. Yeah, you know, it would be a bummer if they skipped the West Coast entirely. It it, it just doesn't seem like that's what they've been doing over the past few years. Uh, even on years where they would skip the Gorge, because they were kind of doing the Gorge every other year, like mm -hmm. nine, eleven. 13, 16, 18, you know, they played the Gorge yeah. 20. Uh, but they were still doing other West Coast shows, even though they weren't necessarily hitting the Gorge proper. So I would hope that there's a, a small handful. Of, I mean, they owe Tahoe some gigs, you know, so <laughs> yeah. hopefully that would be something they come back on. And, um, you know, maybe I'd love to see him in Bend again. Like seeing him in Bend a few summers ago was really sweet. I don't know if you were out here then for those, but um, um, I didn't go to the Bend shows. Um, I went in. I went to the Gorge in sixteen, um, and I think that was really 
it. I didn't really see fish. A, whenever I moved there, um, you know, I'm trying to make, you know, things work like financially. I'm away from home and all this. Mm -hmm. and so um, didn't really get to see a lot of fish whenever I was actually in Portland, which was a bummer, but it was a sacrifice I was willing to make, you know. They don't make it easy on you, though. Like I said, the closest place you could see them, you know, I mean, every other year was the gorge, which is still a six hour drive, man. You know, like, yeah, from where I lot. grew up, six hours gets you to pass Bangor or like to Philly or on your way to Maryland. And like here, it's yeah. like that's the closest place you can see them where there would yeah. be like nine cities in between that and me growing up in New England where you could see the bed. So, yeah, um, again, if Fish is listening, please come and play Portland inside and you can all stay yeah. at my house. Everybody's the Moda that. Center, man. Fish, hit the Moda Center. Why not? Seriously. Um, so I one of the questions that I like to ask, because it's super hard, um, it's almost impossible, is what is your favorite jam of all time? Okay. And then once we get the once we get the core favorite of all time, then we can kind of go into some like honorable mentions, like the tears. So I did mentally prepare for this, and I also did write down a little list because I didn't want to try to come up with a one-off answer for you without taking it all in one last time. So <laughs> looking at my notes, I would say that my favorite jam of all time, and this changes, of course, this is sure. subject to error, um, is probably the 4-3 Island Tour Roses. Oh, yeah. Um, that... We joke that like it's clinically scientifically proven amongst me and my friends, you know, as the experts, <laughs> that um, fish hit the peak of their powers on four four ninety eight, and it's... that show specifically is like where we have deduced that that is where fish had complete control and the mastery of all the different styles they had been toying with through ninety four five and six and seven. There's aspects of all of that, uh, and so. Four, three being right before and i was at that show so there might be some attendance bias on that one um <laughs> sure I definitely remember just being super blissed out like that whole run or the last three nights i did of the island tour and uh so that four three roses is just really really incredible it was you know the first time they took that song out they played it a couple of times prior to mm -hmm. that you know on the fall tour and then on the holiday run and um and then that version is just my what mike is doing is like this just simplistic like excellence he's bouncing around but he's like keeping it so in lock and the groove they hit they sit in that pocket for seemingly like six minutes prior to breaking down into the little start stop section that you know is just like in my head right now as i'm like bouncing yeah. around um it's so good so so good that is that's fucking fish man right there yeah um, and that's one of the jams that i've listened to like there's a handful, you know, that, you know, every fan has, you know, that they, it's their go-to. They're always in rotation. And for the longest time, like I could probably, I don't want to say play because I'm not that good, but I can mouth, <laughs> mouth play every fucking note of that jam because it's so yeah. ingrained in my head, dude. It's so good. And when they, they so slide seamlessly into that one clean stop and it's like, They've been moving on for 12, 13, 14 minutes in this groove. And then, you know, obviously, like, I don't know if they looked at each other or what, but they all just came to the stop at the exact moment without their working into the start and stop, which is what a lot of like Trey was doing in 97. He would like lead them in that groove and then they'd all cut. This was so organic. Uh, and my goodness, just like it's the collective, dude, they're really sharing get, the same yeah. brain. Yeah, that is just on fire. Uh, doesn't really get much better than that for me. Um, yeah. But can I name a couple of other ones I really like? Absolutely. Too? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to look at my list here. Uh, obviously, the, the the Boise bag is really special. Oh, it's yeah. also got some of that start, stop, really heavy pocket, eerie groove shit. I was at that show, too. So I'll, I'll go over some. Oh, of you were there? At the, yeah. That's a that's a good one, dude. That was that was one of my favorite shows of that entire year. Um, and that jam is on a very short list of just my favorite jams of all time, just because I don't think they really ever did anything like that before or after in that particular vein, you know? Um, yeah. There's a, I remember the first time that I heard that I was driving and it, it, I don't know. I, I still haven't found the word to describe it. You did pretty good with eerie, but it's like, it hits this section to where it's you, 
the only way I can describe it is it, it makes you feel calm, but there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. Like there's something wrong, <laughs> but I'm okay. Which is almost like a more weird time to feel calm when like, you know, <laughs> things are about to go sideways, but like, I'm okay for now. But this yeah. takes a, if this takes a harder left turn, we might all not be okay. You know what yeah, I mean? It, like, actually, it's kind of like, you know, if you were lucid dreaming, like say you're having a bad dream, like you're having a bad dream, but at some point in the dream, like you are aware that you're dreaming and you're like, oh, okay, like this is still terrifying, but I know that this isn't real. That's oh. kind of how that dark part feels. Yeah. In that Just like, uh, I think we described it in our little Slack as like weird and breezy. And like, mm -hmm. I don't know if it was breezy that night, but the vibe I get from that jam is like the sonic breeze is coming off the stage. And like, you know, it feels like I'm, a, I'm wearing a t-shirt, but I'm a little chilly. And like, there's this eerie <laughs> fucking breeze blowing over the crowd. Yeah. Uh, love that one. That's a nice long jam too. Oh um, yeah. And then, uh, you know, some of the ones that are a little bit more off the charts that I particularly love, like the 10, 24, 95 run like an antelope. Um, okay. And, you know, if anybody wants to seek that one out, I, you won't be disappointed. I think it yeah, might be it the best. Might be. I like to throw superlatives around a lot, but that might be the best antelope ever. Um, okay. It's on a sh it's on a short list with with a few others, but ten twenty four ninety five antelope is just a, a scene and needs to be mentioned in my all time favorite jams. Um, and ten twenty four is actually my birthday, so I remember that was actually my sixteenth birthday in ninety five. And if only oh, I wow. was into fish then. You know, and living in Illinois or wherever the hell the show was played. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thanks, Fish, for throwing down a, a birthday antelope for the ages. Um, That's awesome. And then um, the spring 93 that St. Louis uh, recording Fish did, I want to say it's like uh, August of uh, 93, which August 93 needs to be mentioned in the all time annals of Fish, too. And you asked me what my favorite year is. It's almost like, tours you know yep. is easier yep. to say than years because like the august 93 run is elite elite fish every night they really started to go type two for the first time ever as a band during that run um, experimenting and, with it yeah yeah and that reba from 8 16 93 is it just goes sideways at like six minutes until like 10 minutes and it's like a type two reba you know it's like it's not reba they're like they're opening it up they're getting psychedelic they're like working on like that in the hay hole stuff uh mm -hmm. that they would do in the practice room and um that reba is an all-timer and then um was not at that show obviously and uh <laughs> I think I mentioned the 618, the UIC Bowie, that yep. just at, with the three blind mice and the uh, the um, mind left body stuff is just wipe out, uh, wipe yep. out, <laughs> wipe out for sure. <laughs> uh, that whole thing is just a thing of its own. And the last one I'll mention is um, early on. I like to cover all my grounds because I do still like a lot of 92 fish too. But um, there's one show in particular in March from the Campus Club, 313 92, maybe some of the first soundboards that were out. And um, that show has a like an insane fluff head energy wise into like the run like a big black furry creature from mars or antelope uh, mashup yeah. where I they're like about. it's yep. got the hawaii vocal jam you know hawaii yep. uh that is an all-time favorite jam of mine that i could throw on this afternoon and, and not feel like it's dated you know not feel like it's literally 30 years ago now right which, which is, is crazy blowing my to mind. Think. I know yeah. where, it's, where it's almost like it's a month out from being 30 years old. That gym, like my, my goodness. <laughs> it's like, what is yeah. going on? Um, now that we've talked about some of our favorite fish jams or some of your favorite fish jams, um, what is a song by fish that you would be okay with never hearing again? Okay. I'll start with the not hot takes. And there's two and they're <laughs> yeah. kind of the same song in my opinion i'm sorry mike but they're both terrible and need to be removed from the canon right away but sugar shack and yarmouth road are, are just trash in my opinion <laughs> um and i'm sorry to anybody who loves those but i'm gonna stomp all over your good time right now and then pee into your birthday dude cake. Uh, I, i'm with you i'm with you on sugar shack i'm okay with not hearing that anymore but dude i love yarmouth road i love the chorus i really do <laughs> I love and that I, song. again like and i and I, I love you and I appreciate you and respect you as a fan, <laughs> but I just have a different opinion on this right now. And yeah. that's the beauty of fish is that 
we can totally vibe and have the greatest time ever at a show. And it's not about even the song selection, you know? It, right. We, so anyway, I'm, I do apologize for my, my no, you don't have to apologize. I didn't uh, write the song. I just like it. <laughs> it's not about me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so besides those, and you know what, like on a side note too, I one one of the new Mike songs I absolutely love is mall and mall is such an earworm. And you know, that song mall. I don't think I do. It's uh, I'm gonna mull, 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 mull it over. You know that song? Fish that kind of sounds it. like that kind of sounds like every uh, Mike Gordon song. It does. <laughs> what you just but, did. <laughs> but Mall is Mall is great. So I don't want to say I I'll hate all my songs. I don't. But Mall's cool. It's an earworm, and it'll get stuck in your head. And now okay. that I just sang on your podcast, that's cool. I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, okay, hot take here is the song I could definitely go without hearing ever again is absolutely one hundred percent forty six days. Oh um, wow! Okay, why is that? I. What about it makes you not? It, vibe with to it? me, like okay, and and this might hurt some feelings, but um, you know, Fish when they first came back in three took them some time to figure out who they were, okay. uh, step back into what they used to be, and they were very much just like this very forward, forward playing hard rock band for a few years and that's when 46 days debuted i want to say that's a 3.0 song right not a 2.0 song um that is a good question i want to say that it's for sure well maybe see. not now maybe did they play 46 days at it I'm trying to remember um so it, there's just something about that style of just like seems like it's always pretty straightforward it's a lot of like type one oh I it's a it. It, they they did it at uh, 2.0. There's some O3s in there. Okay. Yeah. So to me, it was like, uh, yeah, because I, I do want to say there was a pretty big one at it now that I think back. Um, yeah. And just like not feeling that kind of just like trade led rock and roll action. Like that wasn't what the kind of fish that I would enjoy the most personally was. Um, I would like them to take stuff out. I want them to play around with the textures and maybe step into type two or at least dabble with it, if not go there properly all the way. And, um, sure. and so 46 days always just kind of, to me, was just like this rocker and you knew what you were going to get with it. And it was going to be a lot of like of the bright whites lights going on instead of like the reds and the, the blues and the, and the darker <laughs> stuff, you know, yeah. and um, it just never really moved me. And when they play it, you know, it's like, okay, it's going to rock for a bit. Like that's when I'm going to move around the venue. I'm going to go see where, you know, peeps are at, maybe spot someone I haven't seen in 10 years and grab a drink, take a tea. And, um, you know, I'm not really probably missing anything, uh, super crazy as it tends to stick to its structure a lot of the time. So I yeah, guess that, it's that's what it kind is of in this kind of in the same vein of like, uh, like a sample in the jar type, you know, it's like, well, you... I, there is a better chance probably to hear 46 days go out than sample you know oh yeah so I, but i do hear what you're saying um yeah and this might be crazy but i think i'd almost rather hear fish like rage of sample than a 46 days so like, I guess <laughs> it would I be interesting that, right i just put that on record um <laughs> yeah <laughs> but anyways uh not that i hate any songs but you know you asked a tough question so i tried to answer it as best i could yeah yeah the the hard-hitting questions coming uh, on the, yeah and uh, some people are listening podcast. probably thinking this dude what is he thinking and that's okay like you know, we all like what we like, and um, yeah, yeah. No, thankfully, that's... thankfully, Fish plays shows with like twenty-five songs, so something else <laughs> awesome is coming next, either way, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's the beauty of you know the podcast and having <clears throat> having a bunch of different people on. You know, it's like, and that's kind of why I have these these same questions because um, you're always going to get a different answer. Um, yeah. But sometimes you don't get a different answer, and that's with this question. What band member do you think that you would best get along with? Okay. Um, man. So having listened to a couple of your episodes, <laughs> I do know that the trend, I mean, there's no doubt about it. Like, and everybody is right. That's the first thing I want to say. Like, <laughs> there's no question that the easiest one to probably sit and chill and have beers with would be John. Um, mm -hmm. I've actually met John and hung out. He was friends with a good friend of mine um, in San Francisco back when I was living in Flagstaff. And, um, you know, I remember going to going to San Francisco and partying and um, and he would, you know, sometimes just be there hanging out with my friend. And um, and so I got to just like chill and 
meet him and interact with him back in, you know, this is probably, this would have been 2002, 2003, something like that. Um, That's cool. Yeah. And, you know, he was super chill. Like, you would never know that he was not just anybody else that was like a friend of a friend at this party. He wasn't like, you know, was no rock star. Rock star. Like yeah. No rock star vibe going on at all. Um, and so, and I, I think the other three would all be, you know, a little bit more eclectic for their own ways. But for me, I think I would want to sit with Trey um, because I want to talk about what was going on in the summer of 93 and then taking stuff out with the angular type 294 because that was an enormous shift for the band. And then I mm-hmm. want to talk about, you know, um, how that transformed with the larger venues into like the absolutely blissful chaos that they were doing in 95 and i just want to pick his nerdery you know and i think he would be inclined to sit and want to just talk about that with me for a few hours if the conversation was easy going you know right and um and that that to me would would be absolutely epic to get to sit with trey and because i'm not so sure the other guys would even be able to go into anywhere near the kind of detail that trey would be able to he seems like he would still have such recall over all that too you know? Yeah, and that's a that's a really good point because I mean it's it's no question that Trey is the absolute leader of Fish, and I I'm not saying that the other band members didn't have any say or input in you know like what they do or where this is going, um, but you can definitely tell that he is the main driver of like the creative control and like with the, what what you what you were saying like going from '93 to '94, arguably the most growth. It, between those two years that the band has ever had you know and coming into their own and i really feel like trey was the driver in that of like hey we're gonna try this like and so it would be cool to sit down with him and have him break that down like even year by year like okay yeah. we did this and then we did this or he might just be like man it that's just how it happened it evolved that way <laughs> you know but i feel like he would nerd out on it i think he might start with that and then you know if you get to sit for an hour or two and you can pick him be like okay so in early 94 you know hoist was recorded it's being mixed like what was it like in the practice room where you guys were writing these relatively structured songs for hoist but then going on stage and blowing these bowies and you enjoy myself and tweezers wide open into type 2 territory like that to me is just so super interesting because that ended up becoming the hallmark of why fish destroyed the universe in 97 was because they had (laughs) just decided to open up anything and everything at any moment. And that was where fish truly became the art of the unknown where anything could happen tonight, you know? And if you miss a show, you're going to be bummed because if they do this and you miss it, you're going to be super pissed, you know? Yeah. And that's Um, why we all go. You like, you you just said, you never know. It's the Forrest Gump thing. You never know what you're going to get. And the FOMO is real. The FOMO is real, man. Like, I don't (laughs) want them to, like, drop that thank you encore at Dick's and me not be there because that hurts my feelings a little bit, you know? (laughs) Like, I'm (laughs) super glad for everybody there, but it hurts my feelings that I wasn't there. (laughs) Dude, and you talked, you mentioned um, your birthday show um, a a while back in the episode. Um, That thank you at Dick's was my birthday show. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's that's pretty pretty special, man. You're probably not going to forget that moment ever. Oh no. Yeah. 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 It was really cool. Um, so we touched base, we've, we've touched base on, you know, how you went across the country, how you got into fish, your favorite jams. Um, so after all of this, you said you'd seen 160 something and 67, 69. I don't know if something like that shows a couple of shows I just saw on this past fall tour in Eugene. So somewhere in that range. Yeah. So out of all those shows, um, you've got some pretty epic memories. Um, and before we wrap up here, are are there any of those standout memories that you're willing to share um, on the internet with us? Like, what are some of the top memories that come back through all of this time seeing fish? Um, it's funny that like some of them are more about like the lot scene and stuff. Um, yeah, and just, sure. like, the, the traveling too. Uh, but one of the most specific show memories that I'll never forget was um, the mosh pit at uh mary mother for sabotage in the summer of 98 oh like, i was about to that, say mosh pit <laughs> that was sabotage and i mean this is a fish mosh pit mind you but still like <laughs> a, a mosh pit nonetheless like people were like yeah. gently bumping into each other um yeah. it was that was madness um obviously the summer of covers and they had been doing something wild and and unfortunately for me fish was going south that night 
to Virginia Beach and I was going back north to like finish up the rest of the run on the way to the lemon wheel. And so I skipped the Terrapin Station show. So that was a really bad call. Um, mm. But, you know, either way, regardless, like that Meriwether show, um, that sabotage was a, a clear memory of mine that I'll never forget just seeing so many people both in the pit and like up on the lawn just absolutely fucking thrash to beastie boys was really cool yeah. i was the, into the beastie boys at the time like um ended up seeing them a little bit later that year after the london wheel they played a show in worcester like from the oh, hello cool. nasty tour and um that was really really cool like getting to see fish do the beastie boys and then actually getting to see the beastie boys like shortly thereafter and uh yeah, that's, that's cool. a memory. I'm like, I, there won't ever be another mosh pit of fish. Pretty much guaranteed. <laughs> you know, that was probably yeah. the one and only. Um, yeah. And then um, there's a few things. I, I made a note. So if you see me looking over, I just there's a couple things I didn't want to forget to mention. Um, they're like the characters that used to be at Fish, um, like Lawn Boy. Um, Lawn Boy was like infamous through like the mid to late 1.0. And anytime you'd see him, it would be, Hey, Lawn Boy. And you'd yell it out and he'd like turn and like whip candy at you. And like, that was the thing. And so what, what did he, I haven't heard about this. Like, was he, he like, like dressed? This, he wore like this green costume that had like a cape on it. And like, I, he had like dark hair and he might've had glasses and just like this super nice dude. And I'm sure he's like in some of the old almanacs and stuff. He was probably in that. 94 costume contest um that they did because he was a, an old time og 1.0 guy and okay. and that type of stuff like i still remember just like looking up and seeing hey lawn boy you know and if, if you yell that and he saw you he just turned and throw candy at you and those were like some of the early fish things that were like pretty special and pretty small time um yeah just things that stuck with me all this all all through the years um and then um you know i remember fish I don't know if they still do this, but like the, the Uno game was pretty popular back in like oh, yeah. the 90s, Fish Uno. And yeah. um, there's a bunch of schools of thought about what the what you were supposed to do with your card or, you know, your cards or whatever. And you'd always see people pin them to their hats or their shirts. And um, and I remember getting my first card at the Lemon Wheel and then somebody pulling me out of the, the tarmac one of the afternoons, Saturday afternoon in between sets. And and it was this dude and he was just so amped and he was like, brother, I found you. And we had, he's like, I found you're my match. You're my card. And so I guess I always thought like Uno was like to try to find your match. Now, whether that was actually the game or not, like, I don't, I never dug that deep into it. Um, but he like had this backpack um, beverage dispenser full of screwdriver. And he's like, here, let me fill up all of your cups with screwdriver. We're going to hang out. We're going to like walk up and down the strip for a while. <laughs> and so like the Uno game was was really fun and meeting that dude out of nowhere. And I still have my Uno card. It's in like one of that first one was in like some of my, my books of tickets and stickers and stuff. And um, yeah, here the you mentioned the Uno. Yeah. I remember I have, I have two Uno cards. Um, they're here somewhere. I don't know. They're probably on the bookshelf. Um, I haven't seen them in a while, but I remember like getting at two different shows, you know, probably two different years, even like getting handed Uno card. And they're like, Oh dude, you got an Uno card. And I was like, what does that mean? And I right. never knew. And I just, they're like, hold on to it. And I was like, okay. So it was in my wallet for the longest time. And I'm just yeah. like, okay, I'm carrying around this Uno card now, but that's pretty cool. And it makes sense that were you saying like people would tape them or pin them to their hat and shirt. And if you find yeah. your match, it's like, Hey, you're my Uno you're my, brother. You're my new best yeah. friend. And we're going to rage all night tonight now. You yeah. know, that's yeah. cool. Funny, fun know memories. That. Yeah. And then I remember like having it in Atlanta the next summer in summer 99 having it and then seeing him again and he was like here we are again and it was like dude <laughs> we it seemed like the lemon wheel was just yesterday but it's like a year ago and uh and here we are again like in the swampy heat of Atlanta on fourth of July weekend and I'm hanging out with my freaking yellow six uno buddy again and just like <laughs> like we never left just like we're we're brothers now and, and yeah. here we go so uno is really fun game um and then I mean there's there's a couple of stories that are I'll tell them. Fuck it. Who cares? Um, yeah. So at Big Cyprus, uh, there weren't cops. You know, they were like the red shirted mounted police, but they're only there to keep the peace. There was like there wasn't supposed to be a police presence at all because it was very much um, Seminole reservation and they call the shots of what goes on there, you know. Sure. Um, but they did have some like yellow shirted security around that were, you know, basically there for parking and for emergencies. And and a few of these kids like started using their yellow shirts as like confiscating stuff from people like illicit mm. drugs and things. And so 
we're like about to go into the midnight set, you know, maybe, yeah, we're about to go into the midnight set. And this dude pops up out of nowhere. And he's like, Hey, he's like, I just found where the yellow shirts are illegally grabbing stuff from people and like what tent they're hiding it in. And he had this backpack and he pulled it out and it was just full of everything. And so we referred to him as the Santa Claus of drugs, you know, <laughs> yeah, and sure. he fucking popped up and he's just like handing out this and handing out that. And people are like walking up and they're just like putting out their hands and he's just like dumping things into it. And it was just like, Oh my God, this is fucking wild. Like, thank you, dude for wow. whatever it is and he's like i'm not going to tell you where the tent is but like i'll probably go back and make another stash raid later tonight yeah like, yeah bro you go get it like they're not here to steal our shit uh yeah. so that was something that was like just funny and always stuck with me kids are always yeah. looking out for each other you know and you know um, whenever those security guards got back to that tent and saw the shit missing they were like oh my god <laughs> hey this is your own fault you know yeah. This, is, yeah. this is all on you um yeah and then a similar story, like in uh, in December of '99, on the on that uh, late fall run, early winter, um, in Philly. You know, Philly is obviously known for tanks. It's just I'm not into that, just for the record. But a lot of people right. are, and that's fine. Do what you want to do. I'm not here to judge what anybody does. Um, right. But uh, cops were all over the place in Philly. It's not a reservation by any stretch, and um, <laughs> and they were yanking tanks left and right. It seemed like every five minutes they were taking a tank, and they were throwing them on the back of like the police truck. It was like a pickup truck though that had like an open back. And mm. as they're confiscating, I don't know what this dude thought, but like he, the guy, the cop driving the truck, ended up like driving it into Shakedown <laughs> instead of like whatever easy access he could have got out of there. So of course, mob of people swarm around the truck. The cop can't drive, and people are yanking tanks back off of the police truck, like oh. stealing back their shit. And the truck, the cops just like stuck, and like people are making it so they can't open their doors. And he's like trying to get out, and t tanks, four, five, six tanks left and right are being like yanked off the back oh of the police truck, God. back into the lot, back for consumption. So yeah, Philly, way to get it. You know, nobody will ever doubt your uh, <laughs> your dedication to the cause. Uh, total Philly move. <laughs> total Philly move. <laughs> and like my friends and I, like. Uh, just like in awe of this happening like wow this is really really cool actually like this guy made a bad choice and the, the kids are going to make him pay for it taking um, the power back <laughs> gonna take the power back you know and um and you know one more story i'll mention i had some uh i did the comeback run in 2002 and through the through the grace of all that is above um a friend of mine got a ticket for me for the new year's eve show and um and it was a really great ticket it was like on page side it was like front row on page side in madison square garden that night and i was living in flagstaff at the time and obviously going home was dependent upon having at least one ticket to the four three nights of hampton in the one night of msg and got the msg ticket so i said okay i'm gonna book the trip home and, and went home so i went to hampton with zero tickets though and Ooh. That was rough. You know, that was like some of the hardest tickets ever. Fish was back after years and it's Hampton. It's mm -hmm. a pretty small venue. And uh, and out of all the shows I've been to, I've never been shut out. I've been to a lot of shows without tickets and got them there. But, you know, maybe 40 percent even, but never got mm -hmm. shut out. And this was the closest I ever came. It was like four songs into the first set and I'm not inside and I'm Ugh. and I'm there with my partner. And, you know, uh, one of my friends who found a ticket miraculously was like, here, I can't have a ticket for you, but I can hand you this mushroom chocolate. And he's like, if you don't get in, you can always just eat this. And I was like, okay. So I had this mushroom chocolate in my pocket and we're over on the side of the venue and they're, the fish is on. They're like a few songs in. And um, I found the security guard and, you know, just begged him if he would let us in through the side door. And, mm -hmm. you know, and he just kind of intimated that he wanted something to trade. And I was like, I had this mushroom chocolate. And he's like, he just looked at me and just kind of like opened the door a little bit. And my, my girl and I, we just went in. And, and you know, that, nice. that was a pretty amazing situation. So that was night one. And so then night two, um, you know, Fish Green Crew. I think Green Crew is still a thing. They, they yeah. might be. Yeah. I yeah. uh, did a lot of Green Crew over the years. Um, That's awesome. Picked up a lot of bottles. And I'd never asked for a Green crew, crew ticket before. Like out of all the years, since 98 that I've been picking up bottles, I'd never, you know, Green Crew would have their meeting before the show, every, they'd hand out tickets, and then um, everybody would meet up after the show and get trash bags. And mm -hmm. uh, and so I went to the Green Crew meeting prior to the show, and um, 
and basically just told Jimmy, who used to run G Crew, like, hey, man, like, this is my story. I know you've seen me here a lot. Like, I've never asked you for anything, but I'm going to ask you tonight for a ticket for Gene Crew. And, uh, and there was one. So I got one in Miracle. So, okay, night two in. Um, and then night three, um, one of the episodes I listened to your podcast was a similar story. Um, <laughs> one of the dudes got in by somebody slipping him a ticket behind him in line. And yeah. so, I just decided to roll with it. Didn't have a ticket. Walked up to the turnstile anyway, and um, you know, one of my friends was a couple people in front of me, and um, and this was the first tour that they were scanning barcodes. Like mm. fish, fish was no longer rip your ticket and go. And this was like when they came back in 0203, It was all like scanning now. Yeah, and mm -hmm. so there was a rumor that a ticket could get scanned twice within the first 10 seconds and it would work both times. Like it took the system 10 seconds to register. Oh. <laughs> and so we heard that. And so my friend, I had her go in one spot. And so there was one person in between us. And so she went through, got her ticket scanned, put her ticket in this like little black mitten thing that I was wearing. Cause it was cold. And she like threw the mitten back to me. Like it was just some gloves. The dude in front of me went, I'm like trying to rush him through hand him the stub beat right through so it totally worked like both ticket nice. stubs were able to be read within 10 seconds so managed to finagle myself into all three of those nights miraculously um yeah and uh you know thankfully since, since then there's been a few other times prior to that had to like jump over a fence or bribe a security <laughs> guard in kansas in the fall of 2000 like you know do you ever go to kansas you ever go to uh bonner springs um, it's funny that you bring this up because I was in the group text that I was talking about and we were trying to figure out, um, on the, on our last guest on the episode where we had met. Cause I know that we had met a couple of times. We couldn't figure out what show it was at. And for the longest time, I thought it was in, um, St. Louis, but it wasn't, it, it wound up being in Kansas city. Um, so, uh, to answer your question, um, yes. Or, no, that was Kansas City, Missouri. Honor so Springs no. is like the amphitheater. It doesn't have like a cover over the seats or anything. It's like kind of wide open. Um, Maybe. The reason I, I ask know. is there's this weird like old medieval kind of, I don't even know what it is. Like it's in the parking lot of the venue. And so okay. there are like all these structures that are like at the end of the parking lot. So the parking lot kind of functions for like both of these things. And I don't know if it's a museum or like this, this medieval, like summertime fair set up. Oh, and on the, beyond that, there's like woods. And so we thought we could like cut around that, climb through the woods, come up the backside and like find our way to like jump over the, the wall, get into the venue. And there's a security guard station back there, of course. Obviously. And as we're yeah. up there. So we bribed him like 20 bucks each and he like let us go through. Uh, yeah. You know, dude, you do what you gotta do to get in, man. You know? Yeah. And that's the thing is like people are like scared of getting shut out. But these people that are working like the security, like at these venues, you know, they're a lot of the time they don't really care, man. They're just, no. they're doing their job. And if you walk in and hand them a folded up 20 instead of a ticket, they're going to, I mean, you have to hit the right person, you know, and you can yeah. try it a few different places, but you, you have a really good chance of getting in the show. If you're shut out with a $20 bill, I'm Agreed. not saying, Hey, not saying we should nope. steal from the band and do all that. I'm just saying when times are tough, you know, you, you <laughs> gotta do what you gotta do man agreed you know and i do not condemn or condone anybody else's decisions i'm just exactly. telling some of the things that i did in retrospect um <laughs> yeah. and uh yeah so there that's fun and you know there's there's one more story about the first time we were ever in vegas was that fall of 2000 and nobody was 21 and i don't even remember how we got hotels credit cards we <laughs> like I, I didn't have a credit card like i don't know if anyone of us did we got a hotel room anyway we were at the circus circus and um and we had a room that first night and then the second night they moved us from that room to a different tower and the numbers were like really similar to the rooms and so when we told everybody the memo of like hey we're moving rooms tonight um some of the people didn't get the memo and so you know they went back to the first tower after the first night of fish first morning or whatever and they're like apparently they were like banging on the door of the room we were in the first night all night long asking to get in and eventually like no one opened the door so they just like went to lay down and went to sleep in the hallway like outside oh of the my room God. and so finally we 
we thought, hey, maybe we should send somebody over to the other tower to see if people are like over there trying to get into the room. And we went over there and sure enough, there's like three of our friends that are like asleep outside the room. And we're like, what are you doing? You know, oh my they're like, God. you wouldn't open the door for us. It's like, this is not our room anymore. <laughs> like, you're lucky that it's us finding you and that you're not getting arrested or a venue security is not coming to get you out of your hotel security. Right. Um, you know, 19, 18, 19, 20 year olds, like being in Vegas for the first time, far away from home. Like it was, uh, that was, that was Locked bonanza. Out of your room. We, yeah, we left no stone unturned that weekend. Uh, <laughs> Trey's birthday, it felt like all of our birthdays, fish was coming to a close. Um, you yeah. know, it was time to go get it. And uh, anyway, just fun little, just fun little snippets of stuff along the way for fish where you're like, some of those memories are great and some of them are pretty stupid, but they're all part of who I am. Yeah. yeah, all part of the experience, man. Yeah. I, and I love hearing them. I, that's my favorite part. And that's why I like to wrap up with the stories, man, because everyone has a different story or stories, you know, from tour. Uh, some are really similar. Some are extremely different. And that's one of the, like, the main reasons that I wanted to start this. So, Joseph, thanks for coming on, man. I loved hearing your story. I love getting to meet you um, whenever I'm back on the West Coast, um, whenever I'm putting this in the universe, whenever Fish plays the Moda Center. I'll be yeah, there. Yeah. We'll link yeah. up, man. And uh, we'll see some fish together. It was great meeting you. Anything else you want to you want to talk about before we wrap up? No, man. I think we we went there. Thanks for letting me go long. Thanks for letting me, you know, ramble on. I tend to go on these uh, diatribes where. No, I love uh, it, man. You know, once the, <laughs> like I said, once the floodgates are open, it's hard to reel that in. But it was a pleasure <laughs> meeting you, man. I love your podcast. Please keep it going. Thank and you. I can't wait to, to see what the next person down the line has to say. And I'll be listening intently to, to try to, to attach myself to some of those memories. So it's really special. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks again, Joseph. We'll Thank see you. you uh, we'll me. see you on tour. Cheers. <laughs>